in the light of uh, frequent uh, human grizzly bear conflicts, the Montana Department of Fish and Game was advising hikers, hunters, fishermen to take extra precautions and keep alert for bears while they were out there in the field. And then they were advising the uh, outdoorsmen to wear noisy little bells on them, on their clothing, so they didn't startle the bear and they, they aren't expecting them. So it says we also advise outdoorsmen to carry pepper spray in case of an encounter with a bear. It's also a good idea to watch for fresh signs, bear scat, you know what I mean? So the outdoorsmen should recognize the difference between black bear doo-doo and grizzly bear doo-doo. Black bear is a little smaller and has little berries and uh, squirrel fur in it, maybe some rabbit fur. And the grizzly bear doo-doo has little bells in it and it smells like pepper. See, she didn't think that was funny. <laughs> I tried it on my son last night. He thought it was funny. <laughs> I don't write these. I just read them. Luke chapter 17, 15 to 18. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Dear Lord, we thank you this morning for your word, for the power that's in it, Lord. And I thank you that I have the opportunity to bring this word to the family in this house today. And I pray that you will guide it to where you would have it to go, that you will have that it will have the effect that you want it to cause. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're talking today about praising God for what he does for us. Praising and thanking. This guy threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. Recognizes that, that Jesus touched him and he was healed. And, and the rest, the other nine, where were they? Jesus said, where are they? In the Bible, a man named Elkanah, and this was in 1 Samuel, had two wives, Hannah and Penina. Why, did it, why were they having two wives back in those days? You know, don't you have your hands full with one? I mean, <laughs> two wives. But that's what they did back then. But they would go to Shiloh every year. Shiloh was where the Ark of the Covenant was. And they would worship and sacrifice. And the Ark of the Covenant was there in those days. This was before King David. This was, David it was the one that conquered Jerusalem and uh, started putting, um, uh, putting, they brought the Ark of the Covenant there. But this was before that, before the conquest of Jerusalem. And, and Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Penina tormented Hannah made fun of her because she had no children. And that torment caused Hannah to be in deep distress. And this went on for years, it says. And one time in Shiloh, Hannah stood there praying without moving her lips. And Eli was the priest there in those days, and he accused her of being drunk because she was standing there like that she was praying but her lips weren't moving or maybe her lips were moving but there was no sound but anyway he accused her of being drunk and her answer was in first samuel 1 15 and 16 not so my lord hannah replied i am a woman who is deeply troubled i have not been drinking wine or beer i was pouring out my soul to the lord have you ever been there have you ever been where you poured out your soul to the Lord? There are times when we should all be in that kind of a place. Amen. Hannah was praying for a child. 
See, it was a disgraceful thing in those days for a woman to be what we call barren, for her not to have any children. And a rival wife tormented her. And this went on for years. So Eli answered her in verse 17. He said, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. That's a prayer. May the God of Israel grant it unto you what you have asked of him. She was asking, of course, for a child. Eli had compassion and understanding. Without even knowing what her grief was about, he didn't ask her. He, she said, I'm in deep distress. And he said, go in peace. Not distress, peace. Go in peace. And may the Lord give you what you are asking. Sometimes we pray for someone without knowing what the depth of the matter is. Eli didn't know the depth of the matter. He didn't know what the matter was. We don't need all to know all the details because God knows. But we do need to have empathy for someone who is in distress that, that asks us to pray or that we're, they come to our attention we're praying for. But God knows what's going on. Eli didn't ask her why she was in distress. At least it isn't recorded if he did. But in verse 20, here's what happened. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. Now, I don't know what that means in the course of time. Most likely it was within the year, I would think. But it doesn't say. It says in the course of time. So Samuel was born when he was a small child. Most of us are born when we're small children. But he was the answer to their prayer of his mother and Eli the priest. And when he was weaned, his mother took him to Eli to be dedicated to the service in the temple. In those days, I don't know how long it took for a child to be weaned, for a child not to have to nurse at his mother anymore. A couple of years probably. I think they used to do that much longer than they do these days. But Hannah was so grateful to God for blessing her with this child that she was determined to give him to the service of the Lord at Shiloh, even though she would only see him once a year. Mothers, can you imagine? You were desperate for this child. You honor as the child came from God. And now you're going to give him to the service of the Lord as a little tot. And only see him one time a year. In, uh, in verse 25 to 28, it says, When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli and said to him, Pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life. He will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. What an awesome picture. What an awesome picture. But the torment that Penina was doing, she couldn't do that anymore because now Hannah is shown to be able to have a child. But that torment was a long torment. It says it was years. Now can you imagine the extreme joy at finally having a child, proving to herself and the community around her that she was not barren, that she was not a barren woman. From terrible torment to extreme joy, we have the recorded victory prayer that Hannah prayed. Her thoughts and feelings at that time are set forth in Hannah's prayer, recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 2, the first 11 verses. And this prayer, by the way, became a song 
and that was passed down through the Hebrew generations. They would sing this song of Hannah's prayer. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. Rejoicing from her heart, from the deepest part of her, comes the rejoicing. And she's expressing this unto God. The image horn, where it says, my horn, in the Lord my horn is lifted high. That was taken from, that image was taken from oxen and those animals they thought strength was in their horns it's a favorite hebrew symbol the horn and one that had become familiar to them from their long experience dating from patriarchal times as a shepherd people her strength she had none she was unable to change her former situation my strength is in the Lord. The only strength that she had was the strength of God which had come to help her. That's what she's expressing in that horn. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. In my weakness I am blessed by the strength of God. In our situation where we can't do anything about it I identify with Scotty and Ruth and what they're going through. They can't do anything about it except pray. They can, and, we, and, and as a church family, we pray too. Every Wednesday and every Sunday, we pray. That's where she was. She couldn't do a thing about it. Nothing. Hannah's prayer of desperation, the one where she was... Um, where she was praying for a child and Eli thought she was drunk. That prayer did not come through her mouth. That's why he thought she was drunk. It was silent. The anguish in her heart was being expressed to God in silence. Now, she can't keep silent in this prayer song. She's giving God the glory for his strength when he comes to help her. In other words, in the strength of the Lord, my strength resides. That's what she's saying in that first verse. When God does something powerful for us, our hearts should rejoice and our mouth should praise him. Thank you. So I'm keeping this handy this time. <laughs> Out of the mouth comes a revealing of what's in the heart. Out of the mouth. We should praise him. Verse number two, she continues in this prayer. There is no one, no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Verse three, do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance. Now this is being addressed to her tormentors. It, it switches back and forth in here. But... Um, do not let your mouth speak such arrogance for the Lord is a God who knows and by him deeds are weighed so Hannah's rival wife Penina and probably others in that community were the tormentors they were arrogant boasters we have something that you haven't got na 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 and that was tormenting and very painful and hurtful and caused her to be in deep distress. We all have enemies. We all have tormentors. But we have a God in heaven who cares for us. All good things come from God. We are saved. We're born again. We walk with God. Our mouth should boast over our enemies like Hannah's did. 
the accusers of God's people are vanquished. Na 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 na. You dirty devil. You lose. Our God reigns. Na 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 na. Verse 4, the bows of the warriors are broken, she continues. But those who stumbled are armed with strength, comparing the tormentors to her new strength, which is in God. Those who operated their own strength are no match for those who enlist the help of God. We have the Holy Spirit to help us in stressful times. When there's nowhere else to turn, we have the blessed comforter. The one who comes alongside us to help us and to give us strength to get through really hard things. Strength to rise above our circumstances and have peace and joy when everything looks ugly. Strength to become what God wants us to be. Strength to do what God wants us to do. She continues in verse 5. Those who were full hire themselves out for food. But those who were hungry are hungry no more. God causes reversals. She who was barren has born seven children, but she who has many sons pines away. And she actually did have six children. Things are not what they seem to be. The things that appear to the senses sometimes cause us to have trepidation, sometimes cause us to be fearful. But she knew that she wasn't having any children. That's what appears to the senses. And it caused despair. And her despair brought her to God in an anguished prayer. An anguished prayer. We have a whole lot of things that we can see and cause at least apprehension. Maybe even trepidation. A lot of things that we can see and perceive with our senses that are going on, but will torment us. Like Hannah. What we see happening around us, or what we want to see, but don't see, can be maddening. Like these empty seats. It's what we want to see, but don't see. If we're not careful, that can be discouraging to a pastor. I know. Like the images from the southern border that we are treated to all day long on television. Like the Americans left in Afghanistan. Like the 62 million murdered babies who never saw daylight, never looked into the eyes of a loving parent. Those are things we see around us that can cause us to be in despair, that can be maddening. Things we see but can't do anything about. Verse 6, she continues, The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and he raises up. In other words, she's now talking about God's sovereignty in everything, in all situations. Hannah's prayer honors the sovereignty of God over everything. She praises God for bringing that into her life, what she could not make happen by her own ability. She was not able to do anything about it. She could see it, and it caused her to be in deep distress by her own words. But that was now honoring that the Lord is sovereign over all. 
verse number seven, she continues, the Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and exalts. Verse eight, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's on them. He has set the world. In other words, she's honoring the authority, the power, and the sovereignty of God in all situations, no matter what is seen or perceived with our eyes. God is sovereign. Verse 9, he will guard the feet of his faithful servants, but the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. And she continues in verse 10, those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, but the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli, the priest. The first time Hannah, not the first time she was ever there, but the first prayer that we know about was a prayer of deep distress. Words didn't even escape from her mouth. So much was that, was the, what was going on on her face and her body language that Eli thought she was drunk. And the second time we see her, when she brings the little boy, turns him over to Eli and said, I give him to the service of the Lord. And she is giving this joyful, praising to God that he has allowed her to have this child. It has opened her womb and now she had other children after that. It's an amazing contrast. The effectual firm repair of the righteous availeth much and it did. But she goes beyond that to praise God and to declare his sovereignty in every situation. She would have declared his sovereignty had she had children or not. That was her point of view. That was her way of looking at things in life. And the result was this. In 1 Samuel 2, 19 and 21, each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice because you see, he would outgrow last year's little robe. So she made him a new one every year and that was the one time of year that she got to see her precious little Sammy. <laughs> Eli in verse 20 would bless Elkanah and his wife say, may the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home and the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord, literally in the presence of the Lord. He was sleeping next to the Ark of the Covenant. Samuel learned to minister before the Lord, or I mean before, e uh, from Eli. Samuel was a priest, a prophet, and he was a judge. Samuel was a Levite, he did, he did descend from the tribe of Levi. First um, uh, Corinthians chapter 6 does trace his ancestry. So he was technically a Levite. So he was illegal to be a priest. And he was a prophet and a judge. Um, Samuel anointed Saul as the first king of Israel. And he also anointed David to be Saul's replacement. Just think of it, Hannah's little Sammy <laughs> became the most powerful person in all of Israel because he said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. He was sleeping in 
right in the room, right next to the Ark of the Covenant. And he heard God speak to him. And he jumped up. He thought, he thought it was Eli. And he went out to Eli and he said, what do you want? Eli said, you're dreaming. Go back to sleep. And then it happened again and again. And Eli, Eli realized that the Lord was calling to the boy. And he said, this time when he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Amazing. Amazing. We need to say that. Speak, Lord. Are you servants? Are you his servants? Speak, Lord. And then just the still small voice, he impresses upon you something that he wants you to do. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. And because Hannah gave him to the Lord, that was a sacrifice for her to do that. But she had been tormented, prayed in anguish, and she was blessed and gave God the praise and worship and glory. As I said, we have plenty of things to torment us. Plenty. Alarming things that we see. Things on a television, things on the internet. And we don't know what God is doing. We don't know what he's doing in these situations. We don't know. We, we know what we would like to see God do. We know how we would like to see him move and bless. But what we like isn't, we can't dictate to God. We know how we would like to see him do it. But it doesn't work that way. You know, like Hannah... We need to come to God in earnest prayer. Sound or no sound. Asking, not demanding. We're not God. He is. <laughs> like Hannah, we should acknowledge that God is sovereign in everything. Like Hannah, we should give praise. We should give God the glory. Plenty of sound was coming from her in that praising, worshiping prayer, acknowledging the sovereignty of God. Psalm 103 says this, Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise His holy name. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. God has brought all of us from darkness into light. All of us who are born again, as I'm looking across here, I know you all, and I know that he has brought all of you into light. We are the redeemed of God. We're on the highway of heaven. Our destiny is so glorious it can't be described. How can we not praise him? How can we let what we see terrify us? We don't know what he's doing. All those African people that are thronging to the southern border. If you see that, you don't like it and you wish it would go away. But what if there's a person in there? What if there's one in there that will become an evangelist? that would cause a huge revival in this country. What if God's doing something like that? What if? We'd like to see those people go away, right? Be, be honest. But what if God's doing that? Something in there. What if God is doing something? What if? I'm here to say that you shouldn't be terrified by what you see. And, you, and we can't decide how God 
fixes things because it's not our business. <laughs> it's God's business how he does it. We ask him, but a lot of times we don't leave enough room for him to just do it how he wants to do it. And later on we're surprised, oh, that's what you were doing. It looks so bad, but look at how awesome it is. We have to leave room in situations that we see for God to work. Because that might be what he has a, a design. Who knows? I don't know. But we need to praise him for what, what he has done for us. We're all saved. We're all going to heaven. We need to praise him for that. And other blessings that we have. He's blessed us that we don't even know about. He could have saved you on the way to church from being in an accident. You don't even know it. He has angels around us. We need to be praising him. Luke 19, 40, I tell you, he replied, these are Jesus' words, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. They were telling him to silence his disciples because they were praising him and making a lot of noise and disturbing everybody. If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Do you want a stone to do your praising for you? <laughs> I don't think so. I want to I want to do my own praising, not a stone to do it for me. Amen. 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 Well, I'm going to invite uh, Scotty to come down here. And there's an urgent need in his in his daughter.